Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the, um, the latest of the Digital Humanities Research Hub uh, lunchtime seminars at the School of Advanced Study. Um, I'm Gabriel Vidar, I'm going to be chairing this session, and um, my colleague uh, Caio Mello is going to be moderating the discussion um, at, at the end. Um, this, um, this seminar is designed to highlight not only the activities of the, um, the DH Hub here at SAS, um, but also some, um, some of our collaborators and our friends in other DH um, activities um, around, around London and the country and the world, um, and also some other important issues that, um, that are among those that we're really keen to, um, to address and to make part of our activities here at the Hub. Um, so it's um, on um, on many, probably all of those um, uh, of those bases that we're extremely happy um, to um, to have invited uh, Professor Ruth Arnott, who is the Professor of Literary History and Digital Humanities at uh, Queen Mary University of London, um, to talk to us um, about interdisciplinary collaboration as part of her Living with Machines project. Um, so um, without any further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to Ruth to um, to talk to us about that. The the presentation will go for actually. Sorry, one little bit further ado. Um, Ruth will speak for about forty minutes, and then we will have time for, for discussion um, and questions at the end. So please feel free to use um, to use the chat or to raise your hand for questions. Um, and the session is being recorded, just just um, so you all know. So sorry. Now, without any further ado, Ruth, please. <laughs> Thanks so much, Gabby. It's really lovely to be invited um, to to give this presentation. Okay. Let's see if that all looks right. Perfect. Um, so, we are seeing your speaker view, Ruth. Sorry. Ah, swap displays. Yeah. Now I'm going to be really annoying and be looking over here at my notes. So um, <laughs> apologies that I'm not looking directly at the camera. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for having me um, here today. I'm re really excited because um, I'm going to be sharing from the Living Machines project, um, uh, which I lead at the Alan Turing Institute. And it's a bit of a meta talk. Um, I will be touching on the project's research outcomes, but my primary aim, as the title suggests, is to talk about how we've facilitated and undertaken the collaborative work that underpins it. Um, as you can see from this slide, you can get there's a, this collaboration is of a certain scale. Um, we, we list here members both uh, past and present, but it's also striking in its disciplinary breadth. The team includes historians, uh, data scientists, research software engineers, curators, and library professionals, as well as computational linguists, literary historians, digital humanists, a visualization expert, and one specialist in urban analytics. Um, so it is a diverse team. And the collaboration began um, at the outset as a conversation between uh, the British Library and the Alan Turing Institute based on the clear opportunities of its co-location. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, the Alan Turing Institute is the National um, Institute for AI and Data Science, and it has its um, offices inside the British Library's King's Cross site. So not only was the Turing sort of nestled inside the British Library, there was also this complementary uh, set of offerings. So the BL, of course, has digitized millions of pages from its collections, and the Alan Turing Institute holds the expertise to harness that data to answer research questions of scale. However, the Turing did not have a history of working with cultural heritage data. So this was an experiment for everyone involved. So we began in 2017 with some discussions, putting together an initial bid, um, initially focused on the, the BL's digitized newspapers, which grew into this long bid document for a, a scheme that didn't exist. And then in 2018, a scheme that was relevant opened up and we were invited to apply. So the team behind the bid um, proposed what might be both thought of as a data-driven history project and also a human and history-focused data science project. And its key contentions were, or our aims were to facilitate new historical findings about the effects of mechanization on the lives of ordinary people um, in the long 19th century. To provide computational means of marshalling the sort of at scale digitized archives now available to us. Um, and to develop innovative computational models, tools, code and infrastructure components um, that will be transferable to other research projects. 
and, and the kind of underpinning all of this was a, this experiment in radical collaboration of crossing disciplinary boundaries. And so we wanted to also reflect on, on that process. And it's one of the bits of the project that I'm most excited about. So what are we working with and what are we doing? Um, to answer those questions about how ordinary people's lives were changing as a result of industrialization, um, as a result of changes in the workplace, the coming of rail and other infrastructure that change things like communication and access to power. We need a whole range of different sources. A large proportion of our data sources come from pre-digitized resources held at the British Library, uh, plus a small amount of additional di digitization that we've done of their holdings across um, a range of sources from newspapers to maps to newspaper press directories uh, and the road acts, in fact. Um, there's not enough time to go into detail of all of our data sets because you can see there's a lot of them. But I think it gives a, a sense of the kind of a breadth and complexity of the sources that we're using that include textual date, data, such as the BL's newspaper holdings, visual data, such as the National Library of Scotland's Ordnance Survey maps, and tabular data, such as the integrated census microdata deposited with UKDS. But it also suggests the kind of breadth of skills we need. So we don't just need people who are expert in those historical documents and their, and their context, but also the kinds of computational approaches that allows us to leverage them at scale. So for example, computational linguist, linguists who can <laughs> analyze text at scale or those conversant with GIS and computer vision for maps. So I'm gonna talk about uh, three phases in the facilitation and delivery of a, of a collaboration using some terms that Melissa Terrace recently introduced me to. So the idea of a, a takeoff phase, a glide phase and a landing phase of a project. And we're just coming out of the glide phase into landing. So um, we'll be focusing on those a bit more today. So the challenges of a takeoff phase will be really different for every project, but I'm gonna talk specifically about ours uh, because there were some um, specific things that we face, but I think there are also general lessons that other people can take away. So our project was really beginning from a standing start because there weren't any pilot projects that preceded it. There were no big prior um, inter-team collaborations so that we weren't kind of familiar collaborators with one another. Um, there were some members of the team who had no collaborative experience. They were just solo researchers beforehand. We hadn't acquired the data uh, or ingested it. Uh, we had no infrastructure in place. So we were kind of given the money and said, you need to start everything from scratch. So um, at the same time, uh, we had this sort of huge task of creating a team from people who didn't know each other to form a shared vision and then get stuff done in, a, in short order. And this is especially hard when you have so many different professional and disciplinary backgrounds, because what looks like success to a curator, for example, will be really different uh, from what success looks like to a historian or a data scientist. In other words, an output or an outcome uh, is a different thing for different people in our team. Um, and the very process of how we ask research questions and do the research varies so much. Historians, uh, and uh, this, this is kind of the experience of my first book, you, you, you disappear into an archive for a couple of years, you come out, you, you write, write it up and you do most of it on your own, pretty much all of it on your own. A data scientist, by contrast, might be used to working in two-week sprints, developing short time-bounded tasks, and very used to reporting to and working with a wider team. And that feeds also into publication cultures. So multi-author papers are the norm in some fields, but really unusual in history. How can we do work that credits all the collaborators in our team um, who are involved in a given piece of work? Um, but not also undertake a kind of cruel experiment on the team members, especially early career researchers who need to go on the job market with publication lists that kind of correspond to expectations in their field. So one of the solutions that we um, engaged with at the beginning of the project was to come up with a, a project charter. This is a practice that's increasing um, in digital humanities circles. Um, there are really great models from the Scholars Lab, the Colour Conventions Project, um, and the one that we use as our kind of starting point was one written by Stan Rucker and Milena um, Radzikowska. Um, so the aim of us producing a charter was to create a shared vision so that people knew what they were signing up for at the set outset um, and it lists a set of informal policies or values that we commit to abiding by as, as a team but also that we commit to revisiting and revising where they're not working or require nuancing. So we produced our first version 
at the outset of the project, and it was written by myself and the other co-eyes, um, for the purposes of hiring, so that we could give the people who are shortlisted for the job a copy of this and say, Look, this is what we're thinking of. You should know what you're signing up for. Um, and then once we had the full, well, first wave of the team on board, we then revised it. Um, we've been looking at it subsequently and we're in the process of revising it again because the pandemic has changed how we work together. And, and I'll touch on that in a bit. Um, so the charter begins with a recognition that collaboration can actually be quite uncomfortable and that it takes a proactive approach, which can be time consuming. I think there's a, an idea that the more people you have working on a, a, on a research paper, the quicker that it's going to be. But actually, there's a lot of um, initial investment of time required to create shared understanding, um, and, and that needs to be recognised. I just want to share some of the key headings that we um, had in our project charge in case they might be useful to you. So the first is we're interested in disseminating the results of this project as widely and openly as possible with credit to us for doing so. And our policies around credit should balance both generosity and meaningfulness. Um, so actually, subsequently, and I'll touch on this again in a bit, we've written a flow chart and guidelines for guiding authorship decisions. So in brief, our value is that anyone involved at any point in the pipeline of a paper should be listed as an author. But if part of that pipeline has already been published, then you cite that and just list the people who have made the intellectual contribution to this paper. It's a bit more nuanced than that, but you get the picture. But as part of that, we also wanted to recognise that there are different publishing cultures that we need to respond to, um, and that there's some fields in which um, intellectual ownership will be kind of watered down if there's a kind of huge multi-author list. So we need to think about designing outputs that speak to different disciplines in, in a meaningful way, as well as pushing on them gently. The second value, as you can see, is one of the ones we needed to update um, with regard to the pandemic, um, that we value meeting in person where possible and meeting regularly in order to build community, shared understanding and expertise. Um, although we now obviously want to change this, um, I think that that value is really important in putting us in a great place for the move to working remotely because we had built up a really lovely community amongst the PDRAs especially, and there was so much goodwill fostered in that period that it really kind of fed us through that transition period. So um, I think that was actually a really important value for us. Um, so th this next one also could have been written with the pandemic in mind. We intend this work to move forward at a steady pace, given due awareness of the vagaries of life. But it's not just the pandemic we've been through. We're a 23 person team at the moment. We've um, had good and bad things happen to us. There've been babies born, but there's also been people with lo long-term health problems. Um, we, we, had a, we had a death of a colleague on the project. Um, we've had some serious illness. So we, we've learned to sort of flex and support one another. But I think it's really important to lay down that value that you are going to um, adhere to that. And, and related to that, we wish to communicate in, in such a way as to preserve professional dignity and sanity. And we would like to foster goodwill amongst all participants. So, um, we wanted to sort of outline those expectations for mutual respect uh, and assumption of good intent in communications and to um, emphasize clear and transparent communication. And it feels like common sense, but actually having it written down is really important, especially um, in a project where the team was almost entirely unknown to one another beforehand. And our project, project didn't have that deep stock of friendship and goodwill to draw upon at the outset. So I think having it in black and white was really important for us. Um, finally, we, we acknowledge that this project will require an organisational effort due to its scale and ambitions and will therefore develop and demonstrate new scholarly practices in the digital humanities. So this statement um, sought to acknowledge um, the fact that this project especially faced additional challenges owing to the sheer size of the team. It feels like a small department sometimes. And the fact that the project came into being through a sort of top-down collaboration. Um, there was so much work to be done, getting to understand each other's working methods and priorities. And this work required a substantial sort of organisational effort. Um, and when you're such a big team, it's really important to leave a really, power, really good paper trail for one another so that you, you can reconstruct people's thought processes. So minuting meetings and having them in a place that you can find them is actually really important for reconstructing discussions when you can't be in every single meeting because it's such a big team. Um, so it, it relates to really boring things like filing properly. But um, finally, we thought it was quite important that because we're in, located inside the Alan Turing Institute and the British Library is such an important partner on the project, um, that we would 
seek to keep their missions at the center of our intellectual aims and strategic decision making because um, it's important to have organizations on your side rather than fighting with them constantly. Um, so that's how we sort of wanted to uh, sort of start off with a set of values. So we were talking the talk, but how are we starting to walk the walk? So the second thing that we put in place to get the project moving from a standing start um, was the establishment of um, labs. So we chose to invoke the lab as an organizational principle instead of, for example, work packages, because that word laboratory has really kind of specific connotations for us um, culturally. Um, you know, we think of a room or building filled with scientific equipment, a place for tests and experiments. And um, you'll know that if you work in the, in the humanities that there's been an explosion in the use of this word to describe research centers, especially in media studies and DH, as well as cultural heritage organizations. But that kind of concept of experimentation and launching um, experiments was important to us um, because of the freedom we've been allowed to um, try new things at the outset. Um, so we created these labs at the beginning, um, the language lab, the sources, time and space, uh, communities, which is actually more about engaging with different communities outside the project, um, and then our infrastructure uh, lab. Um, so while the, the three I lab was driven mainly by software engineers preferring a sort of swifter, quicker coded and programmatic way of working, language was led primarily by sort of linguistic insight, the space and time by historical insight. Um, at first, the sources lab also it covered both the sort of intellectual idea of um, representative and bias in our sources, but was also grappling with the kind of more pragmatic issues of data acquisition and data wrangling. We very quickly realized we needed a separate group to manage that pragma those pragmatic issues. So we were flexing at the beginning in thinking about our organization. The other thing about labs was that the, we really hoped that by ensuring a mixed membership of each of the labs, we could benefit from our respective disciplinary backgrounds um, and critique the things that worked for us and those that didn't. Um, and then we also encourage people to be members of multiple labs um, in order to kind of prevent this kind of siloing um, of approaches. So um, the idea was these are spaces for experimentation, they're sort of, but they're more like interest groups that you could be a member of multiple ones. Um, and so that was how we started the kind of experimental work. In order to give that structure, we tried another thing. So um, we, we wanted to get um, research going. Um, and at the suggestion of one of our co-eyes in the project at the beginning, James Hedrington, we decided to adapt the idea of um, something called the minimal viable product, um, which is a concept suggested by Eric Ries in 2009, which built on agile ways of working that you find in uh, software development. So it was conceived in this software development world, and it's a really crucial method for starting the development of large complex pro products because it, it, it produces a product with just enough features enough to satisfy early customers and also for them to provide feedback so that new versions can be iterated responding to that feedback. So we wanted to encourage that kind of iterative way of working uh, from a kind of minimal output. So we decided to adapt this idea to create something called the minimum research outcome. And we chose the word outcome rather than output because we realized that the objective of this um, process was to uh, was unlikely to produce polished uh, journal articles or fully operational tools. But uh, the aim at the end was to reach a place where we had first results of a sort of proof of concept outcome, uh, which could be developed in subsequent phase of the project. And a reasonable outcome to us was this was a really interesting experiment, but we probably won't go any further with it. So it was a kind of um, low stakes um, early experimentation phase in the project. So how did we implement this? Well, we began with a design document. Um, it was a short document that each lab uh, filled in. Just have a quick sip of water. And the idea was we, we'd want these design documents to kind of speak across the disciplinary um, parts of the project. So we, all of our design documents should have a, a question of historical interest. So we were interested in what's that sort of broader monograph level question that this relates to and why, why is that interesting? And then sort of narrowing down, could, could they specify a concrete historical research question? Um, and how, how would solving this question help solve the question of historical interest? We then wanted to understand what the sort of data science interest here was. So which 
um, approaches might be explored answering this question with references. And then what's the infrastructural approach? What kind of tools do we need? What software, what computer platforms will address this question? Um, we then followed up by trying to get people to articulate why this was a minimal outcome rather than a maximal one. So what other methodological questions would need to be solved besides this to make a use, useful historical contribution? What's the broader historical question to which this minimal question would contribute? What are you deliberately ignoring or simplifying that would need to be included if you were doing this properly? And what are the minimal data sets needed to address this? Um, and of course, related to that is the question of what, what comes next? What would you do to make it less minimal if we were going to take this forward in, in a future work iteration? We also wanted to make sure that these pieces of work weren't kind of existing in little silos. So we wanted people to think clearly about what they needed from other labs. So the infrastructure, Triple uh, I um, lab needed to feed some other some of the other projects. Um, but how might other labs benefit from it? And um, this was uh, James Hetherington's question. How might this be constructed as a function in computer terms? Um, so, you know, you don't actually have to reduce your research at this level, but he was trying to encourage at this stage people beginning to um, produce this kind of thinking. It shouldn't be narrowing your, your um, thought, thought process, but it should be sort of encouraging that kind of um, trans translation of uh, historical questions into that kind of um, programmatic thinking. So that was our uh, design document. How did, the, how did that relate to what came out of it? So I'm going to give a case study um, from the um, sources lab. So with the MRO, it was really clear at the outset what the advantage of working like this would be for us. Um, the motivation was that it would allow us to time box experimentation. It would force us to consciously evaluate its success or otherwise. And consequently, we hoped it would help us make better decisions about where we were going to invest our resources afterwards. It also encouraged us to bring together collaborators from across different disciplines, that was important to us, around shared interests, to start thinking about different source types um, and creating buy-in from the whole project. So our, one, of, one of our MROs was something called the Environmental Scan. This was led by the Sources Lab, and, and they wanted to determine how representative the digitized newscape newspaper corpora to which we have access are of the 19th century press as a whole. So for a sense of why we need to do this, the British uh, Newspaper Archive has now digitized over 40 million pages of newspapers from the BL and some third parties. But this is only a little under 9% of all the newspapers held by the British Library, which in turn is not by any means all the newspapers that existed in the period. So how can we judge that representativeness? So we discovered that a really good proxy for this uh, was presented by uh, newspaper press directories, a set of volumes that were published almost annually by um, Charles Mitchell uh, from 1846 onwards. And these volumes were initially intended to keep um, uh, a more dignified and permanent uh, record of the press. And in the event, the directories have emerged um, as a really authoritative list of London and provincial newspapers. So what's interesting about these publications is they record important in information about each title, the frequency and day of its publication, uh, its price, its self-declared political leaning, uh, date of establishment, area of circulation, its interests here, um, agriculture, commerce, its self-declared audience, and finally its proprietor here, Thomas Newbold. Um, so in other words, it has a whole host of extrinsic and intrinsic uh, facets that once the titles of the digital digitized newspapers are linked to these, uh, can tell us about collect, um, the digitized collection against all titles in Mitchell. So the first task of our MRO uh, was to have these volumes digitized. Um, we had them scanned and OCR'd, and then Caspar Bielen worked on how to extract that rich contextual information you're seeing highlighted in all those different colors, um, grappling in the process with bad OCR using transfer learning. Then the titles of the newspaper press directory uh, uh, newspapers had to be matched with the titles in our digitized collections, which was, again, no mean feat. But once all these steps were completed, we were able to do some preliminary analysis of our digitized corpora. So, for example, we could analyze um, this. Uh, well, this is the GISC newspaper corpus. Um, 
to see where we have an overrepresentation of conservative or liberal newspapers. And we can use that to understand the outcomes of our analysis and contextualize them within a larger picture. We can do this against all sorts of other categories like ge geographical location or working class interests. Another benefit of doing work like this is it means that we can actually make recommendations to libraries or the companies digitizing content about where they might want to adjust their planned digitization to make the digital archive a little bit more balanced along some of these different axes. And more broadly, you can begin to see how this approach might be adapted to thinking about other collections if you can first identify a suitable contextual data set to tell us who and what our collections should be representing. Um, and we're really interested to speak to other libraries and collections um, about, uh, about doing this. So a one kind of point of comparison, oh no, I'll come to that in a second. So the process here, um, it helped a large and disparate team achieve focus by bringing together researchers with shared interests and demarcating responsibility and identified critical paths of subsequent work. Specifically, we came out and decided that the environmental scan work of the sources lab was a priority piece of work and it's subsequently been uh, led by Casper Bielen uh, and an article is about to be um, submitted on that work. Um, but it also presented us a kind of a general set of values about how we wanted to contextualize our data. And we're, we're kind of in, in invoking that in other parts of the project. And you can see here um, the map, some of the maps work on our project. Um, and the maps uh, team have employed visualization to do an analogous kind of scan of digitized collections of maps. So this image depicts the Ordnance Survey sheets from the National Library of Scotland. Um, and to understand what we were looking, what, what we were working with, our colleague Olivia Vane developed um, visualizations like this to scan the collections for missing data anomalies, and in general to give us a bird's eye view of this map uh, collection. Uh, and in the process, she came up with this really cool visualization, um, which actually shows the process of the Ordnance Survey um, being rolled out across um, a sheet by sheet. Um, so you sort of see a flash as the sheet appears, with the map then being revealed behind it. Um, which is allowing us to craft narratives. And this is going to be um, featured by the uh, Financial Times shortly. So we're quite excited about that. So in speaking about how the, uh, the, the environmental scan has been developed into an article and how the um, visualization work is getting off the ground, I'm starting to talk about the middle phase of the project, the glide phase. So thanks to a fairly intense two day workshop after the completion of our MRO, um, we began to determine which piece of work had been most fruitful and how we wanted to um, invest our time going forward. And it led us to um, do a bit of reorganization of our work structure following that workshop. Um, and we went into a phase where we were about to start publishing our first outcomes. So taking these minimal outcomes, polishing them up into articles, re reprioritizing pieces of work, and actually sort of putting the values of the charter into action. Um, as we face those first publications. So some findings from that phase of the project. So this is a piece of um, work that came out of the MRO work, but then was um, developed into a full article in, in, the, uh, in the second year of the project once sort of we'd really found our feet. Um, so this MRO task uh, developed initially out of a, des a desire to think about the kind of agency that is assigned to machines uh, in, in this kind of uh, landscape of change in the 19th century. Um, and we, we began with the exploration of a particular trope, this idea of an animate machine, or we might, what we might think of as a precursor to AI. So we wanted to analyze the ways in which machines appeared in various texts, corpora, uh, take on human attributes or behavior. And what we needed to do is we needed to start working out how do you locate uh, examples of machinery language where that kind of machine relationship is being explored. So we wanted to select examples of sentence in which a machine is described in terms one would normally expect uh, uh, of a human or vice versa. And we decided to use the latest language models to do this. So the approach we used was to use uh, what's known as a masked language model prediction. For those of you un unaccustomed to um, computational linguistics and nat natural language processing, a language model is a probability distribution over sequences of words. It, it learns to predict the probability of a sequence of words based on a very large amount of training data. 
And you might have heard of BERT, um, which is a 2019 um, model, and it's 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 a success story. It's the kind of cutting edge in modeling, and it's been really boosting the performance of many natural language processing tasks. So what we found was that typical language models uh, for identifying animacy, which are trained on a target word, so the word machine here, um, I were really, really poor at detecting these instances of what we call a typical animacy. That is where an inanimate object like a machine is being assigned animacy. So the team leading this piece of work, which was um, led by Mariona Col um, Adenua and Daniel Wilson, developed a really innovative uh, method that was much more successful that involved masking the machine word in this sentence and then asking the uh, model to guess what word, guess which word went there. So joy and sorrow, life and death wrote the little machine. Now tell me what word, <laughs> tell me what word you think goes in the masked word. And our, our, our contention was that if it's predicting words like uh, girl, boy, man, woman, prince, is that it's kind of detecting something that expect, expected to have animate qualities there. So we developed the model on uh, the British Library's Microsoft book corpus of 18th and 19th century books. And the method is um, outlined in our 2020 paper listed at the bottom of the screen. And we're currently um, working this into a, a his history um, article as well. But what was really nice about this work was it gave us the first experience, experiment of really kind of thinking about how we assigned credit on the project. So um, while it's not common in the humanities, um, lots of science and DH venues are now kind of encouraging people to make very explicit statements of authorship contribution. Um, uh, and one of those is the credit taxonomy. So you can read about the credit taxonomy here, which we decided to employ on the project with some tweaks. Um, and what we did was when we um, deposited our, our author version of this article on um, archive, we gave it, um, uh, and in the BL repository, we gave it a little cover sheet with these sort of film style um, credits, uh, which explains who did what on, on the, um, in the collaboration. And uh, Fede um, has written a lovely blog post about it, which you can find on our, on our website. Um, and this process of deciding author and role and kind of really taxonomizing people's inputs also helped us develop, develop a decision tree on the project of a guideline of deciding authors uh, for outputs because you know as much as we love to get along on the project and we collaborate and we've created a team there are sometimes little sort of disputes about um who should be on what um and so we wanted to kind of create a really kind of clear uh working process and we'll be sharing that in um a short book we're writing on the collaboration process as part of the project the second thing that's worth um, highlighting about our glide phase is that um we kind of recalibrated where we were placing our resources so what had happened in the startup phase of the project is we hadn't planned to work with maps at all. It wasn't one of our digital collections that we wanted to work with. And then we hired a, a senior research associate who was a specialist in um, spatial humanities. And she said, come on, let's work with maps. And so we did a couple of hack days uh, because we hadn't got the resources to give more time to it. But the initial results from the hack days were so promising that we decided to put much more resource into the maps work in the glide phase, the middle phase of the project. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, the first stages of our computer vision maps pipeline. Uh, the general question was, how can we read map sheets at scale, noticing patterns across them? And the maps team have developed a method for making new data derived from scanned maps that doesn't attempt to capture discrete map features. Instead, instead it kind of tiles up uh, the, the map and then based on some annotations made by humans, uh, there's rail here, there's not rail here, or there's houses here, there's not houses here. It then automatically classifies tiles as rail or not rail. And we can see it here making those predictions on, the, on that rail space. Um, and here we're testing this kind of question about the arrival of rail and its impact on the British landscape. So beyond the simple tracking of railways as lines and stations as nodes, we're really interested in exploring that kind of it, visual context around those spaces um, and to use these sort of rail labeled map tiles to explore the similarity of different areas that have similar um, uh, qualities. So what we didn't do was create vector data for all rail lines, um, but we rather use this kind of this training technique to get the computer to automatically label them. Well, the benefit of this is a project that 
might have taken years can now happen in less than a week. So in the UK, this is significant because uh, railway track vector data has been released only as snapshots. So for certain years, 1851, 1861, and 1881. And our method allows for new information about the railscape, rail landscape from other years to be collected. So putting time um, and resources into the maps work has already really paid off because we had a spin-off project called Machines Reading Maps. I think we've got Valeria in the audience who's on that project, which has been funded through the AHRC um, and NEH scheme. And it's led on the UK side by Katie McDonough. So that's a really exciting outcome from uh, that work. Um, but what can we do with those kinds of uh, map tiles? Um, so the, we're now thinking about that kind of ambitious thinking beyond getting pipelines in place to doing historical work. So um, this research is driven by a desire to know more about the landscape that rail created in tandem with other industrial activity. So how can we capture the way that the arrival of rail in communities Fundally, fundamentally reshaped communities. So one thing that we're really interested to do is to be able to automatically compare abstract sort of spatial relationships across the whole of Britain. So there's this classic study from um, 18, 1969 by John Cullett on the impact of rail being driven through spaces. And he notices something that he calls the wedge going through uh, communities. And we have one right near um, the British Library, the uh, Summers Town Wedge, uh, right near the UBL. Um, and we, we were thinking that, oh, we can say, dear computer, please find me all the wedges um, and now tell me who lived there, if you can link the census data. So that takes us to the next um, piece of work that we've been prioritising in this sort of middle phase of the project. And that is uh, toponym linking. Um, so we also started pouring much more resource into that as it em emerged that it would be a really fruitful way of bringing in the work that's happening in different labs together into the sort of more homogenous uh, approach uh, uh, that allows sort of multi-layered approaches to history. Um, so it's the idea that we can link our different source types through toponyms. And um, the backbone for this was the development of a, a wiki gazetteer, um, which um, is enriched with a data set known as GB1900, which is a crowdsourced um, list of text labels that appear in the 1900s um, uh, census, um, sorry, Ordnance Survey, uh, six inch to one mile maps. So our aim is to then further enrich this um, uh, and link it to our other data sets, including maps, census data, and newspapers. However, one of the technical challenges of matching toponyms, both within and across data sets, is that really high degree of toponym variation um, caused by both regional and diachronic spelling variation, but also terrible OCR. Um, how can we make sure that we're retrieving the right place name? For example, if you look at this slide, um, toponyms uh, that we've identified as Ashton under line, the only ones that were being picked up were the red and orange ones, uh, but all the black ones are also uh, the correct place. Um, so uh, our team uh, developed um, a new uh, software called Deezy Match, which was, is a, um, is a uh, flexible, deep neural network uh, to fuzzy string matching, which we found to be much more um, effective um, and had a much reduced computation cost. Um, so this is, this is a really sort of exciting uh, output for us because it has really general applications. It helps us solve linking of our toponyms across our sources, but it can be used for anyone who um, needs to do fuzzy string matching. So I think it has some really broad applications um, and details of that publication are at the bottom of the screen. And also we have all the code in our GitHub repo. Um, so once we have that, we can start linking our data set. So we've recently submitted a paper uh, which links and ge georeferences something called quick uh, station chronology, which is kind of a, a list of all of the stations in, in Britain as they opened. So we have those geolocated now, which is a really exciting thing. And we are currently in the process of ex uh, exploring um, linking other data sets, so topographical dictionaries, the newspaper press directories and, and trade directories because of their rich kind of toponym uh, content. And this takes us into the what I'm thinking about as the, the, the final landing phase of the project. So we are about to um, enter the final two years of the project and we need to take our project and we need to land the, land the aircraft as it were. 
And so that linking work I've just been introducing you to is really crucial work for that final phase of the project. So we have multifarious outputs that we're producing. We're producing new digitized content, data sets, code, uh, tools, methods of paper, public engagement through crowdsourcing and exhibitions. But in, in addition to that, we're also producing a project book that's going to be co-authored by everyone on the team. And it's going to feature the fruits of five or six experiments that bring together multiple sources. Um, and the, the toponym linking is really crucial to that. So our first experiment is going to be bringing together that MAPS computer vision work with the QUICS um, railway data set and potentially also thinking about how we can link the census to it to really dig into the communities affected by the arrival of rail. And I think the important thing to say here is that experiments like this necessarily bring together expertise and experiments that have been being pursued in different parts of the project led by different sub teams. Um, and that's an, another phase of like trying to bring all your strands together. Um, and that's a phase we're looking forward to reporting on. And as part of that landing phase, we're also going to be delivering a short book that I've alluded to in passing on the, our experience of collaboration. So it's going to cover some of the things I've mentioned today, but it's also going to touch on the research infrastructure for digital history uh, and the challenges of working with cultural heritage data in a mixed rights landscape, challenges that have, you know, we've hardly had to grapple with on this project. So please watch this space if that's up your alley. Um, in, the, the, in the final two years, we really hope to continue learning about the process of collaborate, collaboration, even as we look towards the end and the projects beyond. So thank you very much for listening. And um, uh, I'm really excited to have been able to share this on behalf of my team. Thank you very much, Ruth. That's um, a very cool uh, presentation. So much, um, so much content in there. Um, you, you said at the beginning that, um, uh, I think before, before we started, that um, you really wanted to get into the the detail because you know being concrete um, in in talking about um, things like collaboration and so forth is is really important, um, and you you did that. But at the same time, I think you've touched on all of the all of the issues that are, that a very general and theoretical paper would would have done. So I think I think all of that um, you know it was a, a very useful approach. So thank you. That that was. Um, that was really brilliant. I'm sure there are a lot of um, a lot of uh, thoughts, questions, comments from the um, from the audience. We'll um, hand over to those in a moment. Um, um, if I may, um, sort of exploit um, chair's privilege and 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 ask what um, what I was uh, thinking about. Um, the one thing that, that that really struck me that I thought might be useful to to, to talk about just a little bit more would be the um, your um, uh, your your minimal research outcomes. Um, I really like that model, and obviously, you know, being part of a very big project helps helps to be able to do that. Um, and particularly, I think you know every piece of research should include in its um, uh, in its in its goals to decide whether this is a big piece of research or whether it's it's a small piece of research, and that, and that as an outcome. And of course, most funding bids that that most of us have been involved in writing we sort of have to convince the funding body, not only that we already know wh whether it's a big or a small piece of research before we start, but effectively we sort of know how it's going to turn out and we kind of know what our conclusions are going to be already. And, and to, you know, having the sort of flexibility to say, um, you know, we want to try this out and maybe it won't be a viable question um, or maybe it'll have some interesting outcomes in the first six months and then but, but we'll realize that that's all there is to it. Or maybe this will be the beginning of a five year, um, you know, major um, outcome. And, and all of those being being viable outcomes from there. Um, it can be a really hard sell. So I wonder if you had any advice on how, you know, for those of us who, who really want to work that way, but, but haven't always been successful in selling that, any advice on selling that to, mm. to funders and, and other people who, who have control over our destinies, as it were? I, uh, I think that's a really good point. I think that sort of agile way of working is really at odds with what funding bids require of you. But it is actually really it's really complements the way that academics genuinely work and it can, and, and it is very much how cultural heritage organizations work. Um, so I, th I think there can be that balance though, of like showing that you've got bounded time boxes and what you're going to achieve in each of those. Um, I think you, you can have that kind of balance of, you know, very concrete milestones um, with that kind of experimental phase. But I think, if you're if there's a kind of dependency there that we don't even know what the priority of our middle phase is going to be 
until after that. That that is a much harder sell. Um, but um, yeah, well, I, I mean, the reality, the reality here is that we went through a funding scheme that gave us the opportunity to experiment, and that was one of the um, one of the aims of the funding scheme. And I I do think that we should be petitioning. <laughs> for more funding schemes like that. But if they really want us to do something new at the intersection of disciplines, there has to be room for that. Um, so I think on the one hand, we need to be petitioning for that, but the other, we just need to play, we need to play the game and kind of create that kind of sense of milestones being hit. Yeah. And I guess for, in the humanities, especially we, we should also be where not all of our research is funded. You know, we also do some, we have research time and we do, you know, so maybe, some of the more experimental stuff can be in our own time. One of the things that I really think about the MRO though, is that I think it's a really great model actually for um, pre-project. So if you do have a bit of time with some colleagues, it's something that you could do uh, with the aim that the output would be the funding bid. So it's almost like a kind of a test for that process. And so I think you could have a design document like that and the, and the aim is to kind of get to a kind of proof of concept that allows you to make that bid. So I, I think that for me, that's what it, how that's useful to other people. I think it could be used really well in labs or research communities to, as a process of generating bids. So that's my personal thought about how that's useful for other people. Yeah, I guess the only the only drawback is when, um, you know, if, if there's a possibility that your conclusion at the end of that process will be, let's not do a bid, there will be people who will be disappointed and or, you know, harmed by that decision. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Um, I'll hand over to Kayo to, um, to uh, moderate discussion and uh, questions from anybody else. Uh, thanks, Gabby. Thanks, Ruth. Yes. Um, so if you have any questions, you can just write them in the chat and I will read them, or you can also ask permission to talk. It's fine. <laughs> we have time. Um, but uh, while I'm waiting, I would like to, to ask something because you said about, you talked about the, the importance of time to create shared understanding. And uh, I like, I'm part now of an uh, interdisciplinary project as well. Um, so I'm from humanities and then most of the people are from computer science and sometimes it's very difficult like <laughs> to um, find this common language um, so I just wonder how was it for you the process like of having the looking for this shared understanding and uh, if there is anything you you found particularly um, difficult mm -hmm. that's really good I think we have lots of these false friends these words we think mean something but in another field they mean something else or your assumption about what a publication looks like and I just think spending time together is just really 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 important and you know when in in actually spending time together to design the project pro, like a, a small project like an MRO um, sitting down and like working out what your assumptions are about what success looks like to all of you um, but we had other sort of mechanisms to kind of create more space for shared understanding and um, so we provided that training for the people from a more humanities background to get some more digital skills so that they could either do some of the stuff themselves or at least have the language uh, to communicate across those disciplinary boundaries. And I think that kind of, um, you know, that sort of idea of Creole language as the intersection of territories um, is, is a really um, important um, uh, metaphor. And so that the more you understand of the other field, the more you can ask reasonable questions and uh, <laughs> of your collaborator. We also de developed a reading um, group. So we would, um, so that was kind of more aimed at getting the data scientists to understand why we were asking the things that we were. So we would e read important bits of history, uh, like important history papers and, um, and you know, the data scientists would come and read it and they'd come from a really different angle. And we, it changed from being a reading group into what we call the hypothesis generation group where, mm -hmm we would actually kind of take these um, historical readings and say, how can we turn this into kind of a, um, a, an interesting data science question? So that we kind of started, we, we started thinking, oh, we're just gonna help you understand the historiography and realize that we could make it a space for the meeting of disciplines to kind of create research questions together, which was one of the best things we did on the project. Nice. Okay, thank you. Um, Ariana asks, um, Thanks a lot, Ruth, for the great presentation. One question about your guiding phase. 
uh, do you expect any of the lab's MR outcomes to also be made available in the form of functional functioning modules, microservice, and so on? Um, apologies if you said, uh, and I miss it <laughs> a bit of a group today. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So we had like this in that startup phase. We like cr produced so many. Um, um, Jupyter notebooks, like literally hundreds. Um, and we then like had to take the process of going back through and sorting those and saying, actually, are some of these going to be useful to other people? Can we like work them up? So um, Daniel Van Strien on the project, who's um, who's uh, employed by the BL, he's our digital curator. He's been uh, taking, taking time going back and turning things into tutorials. Uh, so doing that extra legwork to take things that have been useful for us in a kind of you know, um, doing pr providing a useful function on the project and saying, actually, I see a really useful general application for this. Let's turn it into a tutorial. So, um, yeah, that we're, we're kind of doing that work, and he's sort of really kind of carved that out as a role for himself on the project, which I've been really pleased to see. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, do you want to follow, Can up? I just follow up on that? Oh, sorry, thanks, sorry. thanks, Ruth. So, it, so is that does that mean that it's mainly then for educational purposes, or, or you see this as potential, um, really bits of infrastructures that others could reuse in in other projects, or or, or you see mainly the educational function, the handbook function, as the one that, that the project was actually trying to. Um, yeah, no, I think these are kind of like bits of code that people could reuse, but I think we need to sort of just publish more and more of these sort of notebooks um, with, with the right documentation so that people can pick them up and use them. But they need enough documentation to just to be useful because some of them are pretty dirty because they were done to fill a particular function. Um, but yeah, that's one, one of the things. Yeah. But each one of our papers comes with its own like little package of um, the code that goes with it. Um, that's really crucial to us but that's you know that's always you polish that right because you know there's a proper audience but it's about saying actually we've produced all of these byproducts we need to sort of work some of those up as well but we're trying to be a bit selective because there was a lot of production at that phase and um we now need to curate a bit so can i ask another question uh because uh you said about the importance of meeting person. So that was in the project like before the pandemic. I wonder, what do you think about the future for your project? Like in terms of, should you keep like this, maybe a hybrid system like of meeting person and online, or do you still think that's necessary to be uh, in person? Um, well, the Turing Institute is not asking anyone to go back until January. Um, but people can if they need to go back before. Um, but I think there's a general shift. I mean, that, that some people have just been more affected by the pandemic than others, and other, some people just really need to get out of working in their bedrooms. Um, but our, our general feeling on the project has been that we want to keep those really boring meetings online. So all the ones where you're sort of doing sprints at the end of your two weeks and saying, you know, what have you achieved? What are our um, to-do items for the next two weeks? Keep that online because it's really boring. We don't need to meet in person. But the actual doing stuff, there's some meetings where it just really helps to be around the same screen. Um, and, th and that's one of the things I really miss seeing that I would like come in and I would see everyone like crowded around one screen kind of solving something or, or, that, or people would be sitting at there. We had an open plan working, but someone would have a problem and someone would swing around and help them with it. Mm. And that we don't have that. So you feel bothered, you, you feel bad about bothering someone do you, to help you with a problem that someone could have actually helped you solve in five minutes if you've been sitting next to them. So that's, that's a real miss. And I think especially for the kind of work, um, like the stuff involved um, that Olivia Vane is running, the kind of visualization stuff. We did a visualization workshop. And if we'd have had post-it notes and our whiteboard markers, it would have just been, it would have taken half the time, we would have achieved twice as much. Um, so the, there's some things that we just need to be in person for. So, But we're gonna really prioritize those things, have real like working together days. To, and then give people that freedom to do the boring stuff online. I, I think that's the best way, but who knows when we can do that again. <laughs> yeah, Debbie, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I had, if I, if I may, another question, um, sort of un unpicking a bit this um, question of authorship attribution for you know, co-authored papers and things. Um, and I really like your, um, your uh, solution of this, this sort of um, 
uh, ontology, as it were, of, of authorship types, which I, um, which I hadn't come across before. So I'll, I'll look into that. But but I wonder if you if you think that's you can you can really ever completely solve the fact that two people might need slightly different um, kinds of, of attribution and kinds of you know appearance on the on the cover of the um, of the of the of the article or whatever. I mean, I, I've I've tended to, if I've been co-authoring a paper with a um, an early career scholar colleague, I might um, you know I might just say you know let's let's make that person first author or let's let's um, make a statement that that person authored you know if they have to say which bits they wrote let's say all the important bits you know because that's you know it matters it matters not at all no one's ever going to look at look at it on my CV and ask that question. Um, but if there were if there were two or three junior scholars involved in that, writing that 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 wouldn't quite be the solution. So you know do you do you ever have to you know finagle that a little bit? I don't want to say lie, but you know what I mean to 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 sort of spin yeah. it slightly differently in different different people's CVs or I think there's definitely you know I think in like say in computational linguistics if I'd like gone through and like done really detailed like suggestions for re-edits and you know done little bits of writing I probably end up as an author on that whereas that's just what you do in like in literature and history and you just the person might just credit you in a footnote so I, I definitely we just kind of like bend a little bit to that but you set up those expectations at the beginning and saying look this is going to this venue so we want to keep this author list smaller so unless you want to be an author we suggest you kind of step back from the work um, and I think we also do have to, at the beginning of the design of the output, say, actually, let's just make sure it's only the people who are necessary for it. Um, it's really difficult if there's like, the postdocs work amazingly well together. So they're often like co-authors together, but we're trying to ensure like at least shorter author lists where we just step away and let them have the, 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 the credit for that and um, just try and support that work. Um, and, I, but, and I think there's also a kind of a flow down effect that because um, some of the history outcomes rely on the... Uh, development of methods that rely on the development of pipelines which tend to have longer author lists there is a it does sort of work itself out that you can credit all that earlier work and then do the kind of intellectual work using those out outcomes um but we're still we're still working through it um and i'm sure we're going to have a couple of struggles here and there but um but we're human beings <laughs> luckily we get on really well so that really helps smooth things over Yeah, we are almost uh, in time to conclude. I just would like to point out uh, the last thing uh, about um, you said that the importance of using the word outcome instead of um, output. I really like this idea. Um, and I wonder, because uh, in my project, like it's managed by a computer scientist and we are the minority as him. Um, humanities and as I as far as I understand like in your project like it's managed by the him him like the humanities part <laughs> um so maybe it changes a bit the perspective in the way it's uh, conducted what do you think about this relation we have a so our project management board has got um well D James Hetherington has left the project but we've got two mm -hmm. data scientists um we've got two people from the British BL from the British library We've got two historians, we've got a computational linguist, we've got an Alan Wilson, uh, who is a kind of an urban analytics, but, you mm. know, he, he set up the project. I'm missing someone probably because it's like naming the seven dwarves and me. So actually we have a really balanced nice. representation, so which is why we've taken on like more agile ways of working than I would ever have suggested if I was just leading this project on my own because there was someone to say we should try this and I'm always mm. up for a new thing. So um, I really like having, I think it creates balance further down the project as well, because it's not someone pushing something from one discipline onto a group that's more heterogeneous, but we have that kind of heterogeneity at the top as well. So I think that's quite important. Thank you. I will hand over to Gabby to conclude. Ooh, thank you. Thank you very much for Kayo. And thank you. Um, thank you again, Ruth. Um, the um, the one thing we we, we miss on these um, online calls is the resounding round of applause, but I think we should we should certainly imagine that. Um, um, so yeah, that's been um, that's been great, um, and thank you thank you all to the um, to the people watching, and also to anyone who watches this in the future um, on uh, on uh, YouTube or, or 
elsewhere where it's um, where it's posted. Um, for those of you who are watching in the present, not the future, um, the next seminar in this series will be in two weeks' time and will be um, a slightly different format. It'll be more of a round table with short, short presentations and discussion um, that's been organized by uh, my colleague Naomi Wells um, with uh, Rhiannon Lewis and Nihana Davan from King's, um, who, um, who will be talking about researching social media in the digital humanities. So please, please come along for that. Um, if you can. And that will be the last seminar in this series, um, but um, the fall or the autumn, I should say, um, series of the um, Digital Humanities Research Hub seminar is being, um, is being planned as we speak. So that will, be, um, that will be announced later in the summer. So thank you very much again, Ruth, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye.